Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers of this conference and the organizers of the Moonshot uh, and congratulate to this fantastic enterprise. And to, it's, re it's really great. I, I think it, I, I see so many interesting uh, achievements here in Japan. And I have to confess, I've never been in the homeland of Japan, only in Okinawa, which is Japan. But still, this is, uh, this is real here. Okay, In Tokyo, I see so many things I'm really uh, fascinated by, by these achievements. And um, so, yes, I will talk about this trapped ions. We heard now two talks about trapped ions. And um, here I will talk about this uh, shuttle approach, but also the linear addressing approach. And that's the menu of my talk. I, I first start with this trapped ion qubit choices, because that is beautiful that we have so many different choices for the gates, for the ions, for the ways how to implement qubits, and that, that can be changed in the, in the run, okay? And uh, we can benefit from this. Then the moonshot is about uh, quantum error correction, and I do little baby steps, and this is the fault torrent parity readout. So that is the color code, and we would just take this plaquette and read out the parity and do it in a fault torrent way. I will tol tell you why. But then, as Jonathan also mentioned, and also Hiroki, uh, scaling up is a major problem nowadays uh, because we can do the building blocks and we have still not a big quantum computer. And for this, we are building up technology, as, as you do here in Japan also. And then there will be also a lot of application cases for quantum computing with trapped ions. And I'm really astonished. We have a little baby quantum computer only and still people are approaching us and they want to run some things and they are like to do this and this and this. And later on when the quantum computer becomes more mature, we are prepared. Then comes an add-on, uh, fast entanglement generation. That's maybe one of the... Uh, bad things on trapped ions that all these gates are pretty slow, especially we heard the superconducting qubit uh, and the Rydbergs before, and so the ion traps, you have heard about uh, the gate of Jonathan, I think it was 60 or 80 microseconds, something like this is a typical value. There are even much, much slower values, like milliseconds, and this is now an option to go to uh, a microsecond or below. So let's remind us of these two gentlemen, Ignacio Sirac and Peter Zoller, actually photos taken at the time when they proposed this uh, uh, paper here that cold trapped ions would be a nice system for quantum computing. You define control bit, you define target bit, you address them with laser beams, and you have all-to-all -all coupling, regardless how long the crystal, and that should scale up infinitely and for this scaling, they put just the three dots. So these three dots are now our main problem, actually, because it's not so easy as to write it down in this paper. And this all-to-all -all connectivity is somehow, uh, yes, it is true, but it's also a problem because it doesn't work, as Hiroki explained, for a full-scale quantum computer with 1,000 qubits or so. So here is now all the variations. It started with Ignacio Sirac and Peter Zoller, and it took us in Innsbruck quite a while to realize this gate then. It was the first gate in trapped ions, according to the Sirac Zoller proposal, but then a lot of other gates came up, the Mölmer Sorensen gate, or in a kind of twisted view, it's the spin-dependent light forces which do these jobs, and that's exactly the gate that Jonathan showed you you can also use magnetic gradient forces in surface traps. You can also use cavity-induced interactions. And we have a Japanese uh, colleague who did this, a strong coupling. I will also talk about Rydberg excitation. And there is the kind of the simple way to copy the neutral atom guys and say we do a Rydberg blockade. But there is also, I think, a clever way to use the parisability instead and really it's a different gate, it's not the dipole blockade, and also atom-ion interaction can be useful for gates. So if you have a hybrid system of atoms and ions in the same setup, and that is a proposal by René Geritzma. So 
Yes, and then you have also the choice of the qubit. So you can take an optical qubit that is historically the first because you can detect this qubit so nicely. You have just this ion in the D state measured, then it is totally dark, it cannot scatter any photon. Or it is in the S state, then it scatters a lot of photons, you see a bright spot there. However, here you have a, a very narrow laser line width, you better have a narrow laser line width, and you have eventually decay, which is here 1.2 seconds. It's very long lived, but still not infinite. And if you have to have infinity two times, you take either Raman transition with hyperfine states, or you take just the spin of the outermost electron, what we call in Germany, the Leucht electron can spin flip, and that is doing the job for the quantum computer, and the ion is just the decoration that you can do nice laser cooling, trapping, and so on. And so there you have a spin qubit, infinity one time, you, you take a nice and, and handy Raman transition between this, which has really an easy feature, then you can convert it into an optical qubit, and eventually you can go, go and make a Rydberg qubit out of it also. So all in one calcium ion, for example, okay? Okay, this is now um, a single ion qubit here. We start with a ground state and then we do Rabi oscillations and these Rabi oscillations are pretty fast. They go in microseconds and then after maybe 10,000 Rabi oscillations, we are here. It looks a little bit more ratty because uh, intensive fluctuations are the, the killer here for uh, you do reasonable measurements, randomized benchmarking, and then you find out you get better than 99.99 fidelity gates with this Raman transition, and it's nice. Okay, everything works there. So, why do, oh, I'm going too fast. Okay, now for the two qubit operation, I told all to all, and uh, these are, sorry, something is wrong here. Yeah, okay. Here are my ions, and you have this, this uh, gate fidelity of two-bit gate operations, which we measured is 99.8%, 8.5 actually. <laughs> so, and uh, this uses the common modes of vibration typically, yeah? And, uh, well, I, I think uh, that is what you want to have. You want to have a large number of qubits, you want to have a good connectivity. Good means not all to all, because that is a mess. You want to have still high fidelity and that gives you a nice volume. But then you want also in the circuit to read out in loop, you want to have feedback, you want to have also connectivity to a high performance computer eventually. So this is all what you need. That's your wish list altogether. And it's not only an atomic physics experiment, but it's really a full quantum computer. So there is much more to it. Uh, which for a physics professor was really challenging because uh, it comes up with all the support electronic, with the compiler, with the user interface, and so on. And, but if we go back, the number of qubits and the connectivity is only working if you have a great architecture. And then you can keep controllability and you can keep cost stroke low and you have no defacing. That is really the architecture which you need to make it true. And the initial architecture was this linear ion crystal addressing. We did addressing very early on. You shine laser light only to one ion here, and that's this blade trap in the lab of Rainer Blatt, and IQT and INQ are using it, and here's Tommy Mons and Christian, uh, Chris, Chris Monroe. So you see all this uh, is wonderfully working, maybe to 20 qubits or so, and then the fidelity drops, yeah? and you have no way out here. So it's not a scalable quantum computer. And Dave came with the idea, divide and conquer. That's the idea of the Roman emperor. You divide the ion crystal into, into pieces, and you can control every piece very nicely. You can do the laser gate again, and you shuttle these ions around. And we, and Honeywell is doing this very successfully, as we heard. We also do this, we have this uh, segmented ion trap, we can shuttle ions, we can shuttle a single one, we can separate two ions in double wells, we can merge them again, we can rotate them and flip them over, and we use for the gates the radial mode, that means the mode which is orthogonal to all these operations, that means even if the shuttle leaves a little bit of vibration excitation in the ion crystal, it doesn't matter, 
because the modes which we use for the entanglement are orthogonal. They are radial modes and they still work, okay? And so our, our single bit, two bit rate, it's, it's okay, but it's not, not super great, okay? And then we, I want to show you this uh, topological quantum error correction. I, I think I don't have to explain you this code. There are the stabilizers. And we are now only looking into these four qubits here, these four data bits. And we have one syndrome which should read out whether the stabilizers are okay or not. And then additionally, according to the proposals here, there is, it's very helpful to have a flag qubit because the, the problem is if you make a wrong decision here on the data qubits, you mess it up completely, okay? This, this code can stabilize only if, if there's not a bad gate here, okay? And you have to check whether your syndrome makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, please don't follow the advice of the syndrome. And if the flag shows red, don't listen to the syndrome, don't do anything because you make a lot of mess. So this is the circuit, six ions, and you see here some gates, and the single bit gates are not even put here in, the, in this uh, drawing. Okay, and then you do it on the shuttling based approach. That means you have only one ion or two ions or zero ions in your laser addressing zone. So if you want to do a single bit gate operation, put one ion there. If you want to do a gate, you put two and so on. This is now the time and these are all the segments. Our ion trap features 32 segments and here are the pairs. So this is the data qubits A, B and E, F and these are syndrome and flag. And now you do the cooling and then you do a C naught here. So time runs by, you do this shuttling, and at the end you detect, you post select, and you re initialize and go back. So on six ions, you see is a quite a, a lot of configuration, 90 different configurations with a lot of different transports. And I tell you the most painful ones are the separations, this merge and separate things, because there you undergo a, a, a change from a harmonic potential to double well and make it two harmonic wells again. So this is slow. The other ones are fast. And then comes the gate. Everything works astonishingly, I have to say. And this is the outcome. So we, we encoded in the data qubits all this kind of states here just uh, by putting this data. And then we measured basically the, the, uh, the syndrome, okay? And the syndrome here is, is high and there's low because this is, a, this is a wrong parity state. And if it is two ones, it's again high. So, so this, is, this is great, it works, okay? And please look only to the blue data. So the single shot fidelity was 92.3%. That was when the syndrome showed, okay, the, the, the syndrome is okay, or the syndrome is wrong, and that was with this fidelity. <clears throat> in some cases, we really observed that the flag is raised. And now you can post-select on the, on the other cases where the flag is not raised, and if you do this post-selection on the syndrome, then you get 93.2. It's not a misprint, and it looks a little bit like, like a very tiny difference, but it is an improvement by four and a half sigma. So it's a really big improvement. Um, still, it is by far not good enough to do meaningful quantum error correction, but it shows the functioning of the algorithm, okay? And now I can show you also how, how hook errors, these are these bad guys, if the syndrome does some bad things, like a syndrome error, this flows back via the gates into the data, and then suddenly you have two errors, and then the code cannot uh, cope with this, and these are the hook errors, and then you could inject by hand a hook error here, so to say, and see how this really evolves, and then we could see that this uh, flag is then detected, and so on. Everything is working. So the fault tolerant readout of the plaquette is basically working with our six eins, okay? So now why don't we go further and do now a wonderful uh, quantum error correction with uh, more qubits. We need only three plaquettes, you know, from this uh, color code. And so far we have only one plaquette. Why don't we go further? And here's the time budget. You see, you have a lot of time for the register preparation. That's cooling. <coughs> then you have the gate sequence. And the gate sequence, 90% is just shuttling overhead. 
and 10% is the gates. And this is bad. Only 10% is used for the computation and the, all, the, the, all the rest is used for all this shuttling. And I think in the continuum uh, work, it is now going to 99%, okay? 99% is green and only a little bit of gates, okay? And we have we have spent all the time with reordering and so on. So that's not good. Also, readout is too slow. That's that's another point, but I come to this later. So we have to learn this lesson: save time, be faster, okay? And so this is now the new architecture which I have in mind. So far, we have tried to play Beethoven with only two fingers, okay? So we have playing Beethoven with this on all the keys. It was not, list, it was not a really good uh, uh, performance, okay? The other option is to have one addressing hand to, pay, to play only with 10 keys. That's also not good enough. You need two hands and to move them to other places. In our case, we have two hands of local addressing zones, but we don't move the addressing zones. We move the keys, okay? So we put together 10 ions in one bunch, in one linear crystal. It's easy to address this one. And then when everything is done on this 10, we shuttle the whole thing out and we put a new train of ions in. And while we do the gates on this, we can reorder this accordingly with the other registers. So you can do in parallel a lot of things and combine these multiple zones for individual addressing with the reconfiguration. And that hopefully brings us to 50 to 100 qubits, okay? I don't, I don't say this is now a full-frame quantum computer, but it's one level of architecture and it also allows par parallel execution. The other point, which you got now funding for, uh, finally, finally, really, very slowly, unfortunately, in Germany, um, that we can make it a scalable device also from the control units like laser and electronics. And we have a connection to the high performance computer which is really in the building next by. <clears throat> so how does it go on? We have level zero, it's ion coupled to this motion altogether, that's all to all in the crystal. Level one is transporting these things. And level two, now there's the question whether you need a highway for ions, kind of a 2D structure where you can say, if I want to have this ion transported somewhere else, I have, a, I have a free lane where only the fast ions go from one to the other segment, which can be really far away. So a fast shuttle of, of remote junctions, or you couple to optics and go basically the pathway that you have indicated with cavities, with fiber optics, and, and uh, that's the other way, okay? So integration of optics is necessary and making it a little bit more 2D in order to have highways on your iron trap chip. For all this, you need a lot of hardware. <coughs> and we have these selective laser etching traps. Um, we have high optical access vessels now made completely from titanium in order to fight magnetic fields. We have this better shielding and we have radio frequency and DC multi-channel AVGs, light producing units, laser racks and so on. Let's start with the mo most painful part and that was for us to get the right traps in operation. And this is the paper by, uh, <coughs> by Jonathan Holm here where he had some first uh, results on, on selective laser etching and, and I've, I've brought some because I'm so happy we have this clean room now in, in operation only for, uh, yeah, we have the, the first coating ha happened in, in two weeks ago and this is the sel selective laser etching machine. So you see this wafer here, this is a really truly 3D, you are allowed to put your hints even on the, on the glass so, so you can feel how deep this is, it's the 3D technique which really goes deep in the glass. And why do I like it? Because these this, uh, 2D traps, they have a problem. They have not this nice and deep Paul potential, but they have just a problem towards the surface and then it becomes a little bit awful yeah, to trap these things for a longer time. The first time we have now everything which you need for fabrication in one clean room and it is exactly right for rapid prototyping. So here you see some features. These are these trenches. You can make different shapes and uh, you can make high aspect ratios. Actually, we have a glass melting machine, CO2 melting machine to make this also very flat and nice without this kind of things. 
And all this dirt, which you see here, will be no longer on traps, okay? Because we put all together in one clean room and don't transport it from one company to the other one for the coating and back and forth and so on. So the other point are the lasers. Lasers are known to be a pain, traditionally, and we dismantle our optical table, actually. So this was the optical table by Manuel Bloch before, and he had the fermion experiment on this, and now it is just uh, pieces out of the lab, and we removed everything, and now Toptica installed laser processing units. So this is altogether five acousto-optical modulators, electro-optical modulators in a block, which is uh, reduced in size by a factor of five as compared to what we do on the optical table. And also this is rack mounted with temperature stabilized things and everything is fiber coupled of course and so on. So that's now how it looks like. We have this laser cooling, we have the laser processing units, everything is integrated, uh, frequency logging, everything is done here in this ring. So we have really a mature lab in order not to be physicists running around a setup but rather building a computer, okay, and then this is the control you need, which can be remotely uh, controlled and so on. This is now the quantum computer control room. You are not longer sitting in a lab to operate this thing, but you are all doing remotely. And uh, it was a very interesting moment about one and a half years ago. The president asked me, there's the inauguration of the University Mainz genau. after it was, uh, uh, after the Second World War, uh, the French uh, restarted this and he said, what, what Fernand, could I show about, um, about the quantum computer and uh, can, I, can I show something? And this is now in Berlin, there is the Parliamentarische Abend, that means the member of the parliaments are there. I was super nervous actually and he programs now the quantum computer, this drag and drop and he can see only this frame but in the lab that's these two ions which had later to do the job. So it's a Hadamard gate, it's a ZZ gate, it's another Hadamard that should give a bell state. And it's very simple, of course, but he could do it from, from Berlin and it was working. And I, I was, now he pushes run and then the thing runs and he gets the result back to Berlin. So um, when, when he does it now, then, then the data is sent and now the ions start working. And these are the, the real results which are coming all the way back. So the user... Um, back end is working and so on. So genau, this was pretty exciting and it worked. What happens then? You have this user front end, you can program either via website, drag and drop or penny lane, or going to the high performance computer and asking the quantum computer from there. Then there's a circuit compiler which converts this into the right operation and a manage, uh, uh, operation management system which can run the system, basically different systems, different computers, and the, the user will not know whether it's on quantum computer A or B or C, because one of them is recalibrating, the other one's doing your job. Okay, so, um, yeah, this is now the circuit optimizer. You, you, you have to mention that, that our gates are this ZZ gates. We cannot do a C0, so everything has to be expressed in this native gate set and then optimized with respect of the number of shuttlings. All the swaps you can remove because you just say, I reorder the iron crystal. Um, so you can then have different degrees of optimization. You can do what we call macro, motion, macro matching, face tracking, block aggregation. There, there's a lot of tricks to compress the gate count and typically we can do by a factor of three or so. Uh, and it has a similar performance as this compiler for the linear ion crystal, but please note it's much more complicated because we have to think about what ion can go where, uh, and it's just a heuristic thing. You can read more details here. So then the circuit optimizer can act with symbolic gates. So you tell, I want to do a rotation, but I don't tell you it's a pi over two pulse. I just tell you A, okay? And later the user will put an A is maybe pi over two or whatever, okay? So this symbolic gates is it's very important for VQE because the, then you will all update this symbolic gate uh, parameters in order to make this uh, round loop and optimize. And you don't want to run the compilation of these things and ever and ever again. And that, that's very important for this VQE. 
And then we can also call now, this is now the optimized circuit. Now the, the question is what ion should do what qubit, okay? And that's, that's the question. You, you have a mapping of qubits to ions. And then you have to translate these ions and then uh, move them around. And no longer a PhD student has to think about, well, it would be maybe good to put this data qubits node to the side in order to put the syndrome in the middle. No, now it is done by the computer itself, fully automatic. And the beauty of this is can work with any kind of addressing units. Now we have in the current, very old hardware trap, we have uh, either one or two ions or zero ions in the laser interaction zone. In the future, we have this 10 ions, but it works with arbitrary all to all in qubits, and it will tell, okay, with this 10 ions, you can do without shuttling, but if you have 12, you need shuttling, and what kind of shuttling you need. So as an example, how good this combination of addressing and reconfiguration is, we can put now a random circuit of, say, 20 qubits, into our shuttling compiler. And here is our present status. We have only two ions in the addressing zone at maximum. And you see it takes about 57 translations, shift operations per gate. So it's a large overhead of shuttling, as I told you. And the same for swaps and, and uh, separations and so on. Now, if you have 10 ions in addressing zones, then you reduce this by, by a factor of three, everything by a factor of three and five. <coughs> That's much faster, yeah? And actually, you can think of our Equan architecture as a co-design of this code, because the code requires seven data qubits plus a couple of uh, flag and syndrome, and this is, makes up to 10, okay? And so this is the logic qubit in future. And then you shuttle around logic qubits, and uh, we know it's a transversal gate, so we can shuttle them together, do the gates, and then reshuttle them back into operation. So that's basically, it has a kind of a design idea before, if you would have asked me, why is this trap with 32 segments? I would say, okay, it was a millimeter long, and we think of this segment size, and, and, and he's smiling. That means he has the same argument. Now you can really tell this algorithm will take so much shuttling or it will not, okay? So mid-circuit qubit detection. The, this is also a painful thing. I, I talked about Doppler cooling. Doppler cooling is really slow. Huh? It's, it, it's what we do every day, but it's slow. It takes a lot of time. So better don't heat up these ions by detection. And there is a way. You can, you can just scatter 729, 854 and get a blue photon. And it really reminds me to your, Hannes, to your Rydberg detection because it's totally background free. You have no blue photons in the system, so if there is a single blue photon, you know, wow, this is a detection. And you make it spin-dependent. It only works from this and not from this state. So there is little heating. I would say no is maybe too optimistic. There is almost no reabsorption by the neighbor qubits. And uh, yeah, and that gives, that's all important for all this uh, measurement-based quantum computing and branching decisions like we have in the quantum error correction. Yeah, and then this is just an example. We need now fast uh, decision electronics. On the, on the FPGA is programmed, the PMT counter goes to a certain level and then um, the level tells us what to do with the other qubits. And you can do the branching now on the motion. So you can say, if this ion is in state one, then please move the ion number three or don't do it, okay? And uh, yeah, it is also nice. We can do some quantum thermodynamic heat extraction that's now on the way that we want to do this mid-circuit measurements for demonic physics in heat engines. It's, it's kind of a hobby, okay. Yeah, but now coming back to the reasonable and the more uh, realistic applications, the VQE together with a major German company in chemistry, we want to go for uh, quantum chemical simulation. And I, I have exactly got the same uh, uh, expression of interest as Jonathan says. If you have really good qubits, and he said even if you have 50 qubits, we, le we would learn something. 
50 good qubits would be helpful, he told me. So you say we need more, but I think if we have 100, we certainly learn something about the approximation that these chemistry people do. And especially in polymer physics, which is a subject of this company, it's really tricky to get the uh, things working. And VQE is also working for high energy physics. It's the same thermodynamic simulation. We are having also the parity QC uh, architecture, and that is the shuttling algorithm for this in plaquette interaction. And then we are looking into quantum error correction together with Tom of, Tommy Mons and Markus Müller and Jonathan Holm in, in this uh, um, uh, quantum logic uh, networks, also in auto encoder and to combine it with artificial intelligence and learning. So how is it going on? We have the scalability direction. We have also reliability direction. And you see it is really that we have now eight identical vacuum systems, identical magnetic shields, identical laser operation systems. So you need to, to make redundancy of the setups in order to really provide calculation for people. If you have just one setup, it will be down and people will not be happy. So the next thing is, of course, to commercialize and, and to think about other things like power consumption and so on. And this is now the new company. I, uh, yeah, it's just half a year uh, old and it's, it's, it's in the baby steps, okay? Now we switch gears, and I would remind you of the, all these nice features. So the fidelities are pretty okay, and everything is good, and we have to improve of this. But the most uh, uh, awful number is here, this one, that the gates are so slow. Because our transports, I can tell you, are a few microseconds. So this is by far the longest time scale. And there are the Rydberg locate gates, which are fast. And uh, this is the review paper, but there has been an Eintrap Rydberg blockade with a fidelity of, I think, 72%, if I remind properly. Uh, this was just a copy of the normal gate with Rydberg uh, atoms. The problem is the ions are not so close, so it's not so easy. Second, the dipole-dipole uh, interaction is not so great because the core is more pulling the iron towards the center because it's charged. And so it is, and also I would say, if you guys are doing the root back gate so fantastic, I should not copy it. So I thought about another gate, which is the root back polarizability gate, and it makes use of a state-dependent effective iron mass. So I will show you how we do root back excitation. We start with this upper level, and then we take laser light 213 and 285, and we went to any Rydberg level up to 65. People told me it's impossible to, to, to go to these high levels because of this hostile power trap, okay, which has this alternating electric field. Uh, uh, Jonathan talked about this, but we have stable Rydberg atoms in the trap. It's exciting. You have to really put them at the very center of the micromotion. If you don't do it, it's becoming a mess, okay? And um, so now the Rydberg polarizability makes the trap frequency change. And that is because of this polarizability. Here's the polarizability. This is incredibly large. And normally you would say for polarizability, you have to shift the ion into an electric field. Now an ion is charged. It will move until it finds a place where the electric field doesn't pull it any longer. So that's why the ions are sitting in the center of the potential. So how can I put it into an electric field? Yes, I can, because I just kick it, okay? And then it will oscillate in this electric field. And that's what we do. And then the modes become independent. So the radial modes get another offset of 34 kilohertz or no, or, or, yes, depending on the Rydberg or not Rydberg state. So you see the radial mode, the, the, exactly the modes which we use for the gates in, in our common approach, they are now state dependent. So this is really for Eintrappers completely crazy that modes become state dependent. For neutral atom people it's completely known, but for Eintrapper modes never become state dependent, and here they are. So you have now nothing to do just to take benefit of this space 
phase-based trajectories because they also become state dependent. And here is what we do if we kick the ion. That's kicking an ion. You see this oscillation goes to a couple of uh, alpha. And then if you kick the ion, the line shifts. And that's, the, that's because of the polarizability. And now for gate, you have, of course, not only to kick it, you have to kick it in a clever way. You excite a superposition, then you apply a kick, you let them oscillate, acquire a phase, and do some phase space trajectory. And the phase space trajectory will be spin dependent, yeah, spin dependent potential. So if you kick it then back at the right moment, you kick it again into the origin, the motion is factorized out, and you have just the area here which gives rise to a gate. And we have now calculations how we can do all to all operations where are the radial modes of kicking, addressing two ions, putting them into D state and Rydberg superposition, and then you can do an all to all for arbitrary ions in an end crystal. Okay? And it's working on a microsecond time scale. So I would say this Rydberg excitation may in the future contribute to this iron trapped toolbox. I don't know, it's coming. It's, now it's really fundamental research. But it's, it's at least an avenue to go faster. Yeah? And if you want to read more about this, this is a, there are only two groups in the world doing Rydberg ions. So uh, it's uh, uh, Henrich in, <coughs> in Stockholm and myself. And uh, I think it's just an interesting idea to go along. Now I come to the conclusion. Combining ion shuttle and addressing approach, I think it's at least to go to about 100 qubits, it's the way to go. And then we have to go for another architecture step, which is indeed optical interconnects or highway fast lanes for some shuttles. Then we have to build really this robust electric and optical control. And uh, I think the versatile interface is really making it easy to uh, already check some first applications and, and let people play with the, with the whole system. The main roadblock so far was to make these nice traps. And uh, the Rootbacks have the beautiful advantage. You f form a pattern with your, with your uh, spatial light modulator and your tweezers. You can, you can handle the lasers. And in the vacuum, there's nothing. In our case, there's this piece of glass, and you have to structure it and coat it in the right way. And all these things are, are now hopefully faster, uh, because we can do then one clean room. And I think that uh, that will be also very important to integrate micro optics. So that's an, end, uh, an endeavor of a big team, I think, all the, all the uh, people in my group about, uh, for this. And if you have interest, you are also free to join or for collaborations, and so this is this uh, part and the Rootback part of my work. I do other work, but I don't talk about this now, so thank you very much.